Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to the last part of my April catch-up wrap-up. We're almost there, only nine things to go. I'm gonna do them all in one video because they should all be relatively short to talk about, she said until she was editing it and went, Rachel, why didn't you just shut up at some point? Um, I'm only about halfway through my cup of tea. It's early on a Sunday morning and my allergy medication hasn't kicked in yet. So as is usual, you're gonna watch me slowly wake up through the course of the video and become more and more animated. Or I might still be a zombie by the end of it. That would not be unusual either. But anyway, let's get into it. First up is Lumberjanes Bonus Tracks, which is a collection of single issue bonus stories in the Lumberjanes universe. They're all written by different people and illustrated by different people. And I thought that the writing was consistently good. They all really felt like Lumberjanes stories and all the characters felt consistent. I wasn't as keen on some of the art styles, but on the whole, the artwork was also pretty consistent with what I think of as the Lumberjanes style. Very loud, bold, and colorful but some of them I just wasn't as into as other styles. So on the whole, I enjoyed this. They were good little short stories. It really felt like it was hearkening back to um, the beginning of the Lumberjane series when all of the stories were single issue one shots and there weren't longer story arcs. I do prefer the longer story arcs, but these little bite sized pieces were also quite good. This is definitely a must read if you are really, really into the Lumberjanes, but if you are not, you could probably skip it and it'd be fine. Next, I read Intergalactic PS3 by Madeline Langle. This new edition is illustrated by Hope Larson, who did the graphic novel version of A Wrinkle in Time, and I really enjoy her artwork. I think it really suits the middle grade and nature of these books. This story is a little one-shot set in between A Wrinkle in Time and the second book in the series, A Wind in the Door. And I think I want to preface this by saying that I know a lot of people have been reading or revisiting A Wrinkle in Time this year because of the movie that just came out, and I've noticed that a lot of adults seem really disappointed by A Wrinkle in Time. Some people really dislike elements of it and that it's old-fashioned, that Meg is irritating or it contains some heavy-handed theology or whatever. I've actually reread the entire Time Quintet as an adult and absolutely loved the books. I was pretty much raised on a diet of Madeline Langle. I adore her books and they're really near and dear to me. And I didn't have any problems with A Wrinkle in Time. So maybe I have an unpopular opinion there. Intergalactic PS3 sits somewhere in the middle. This is just a little one-shot story. I think it was published in 1970 for a library week or something like that. And I don't think that it really fits neatly in the internal chronology of the series. Like, it repeats some events. It seems to lift some of the story directly out of a wind in the door. And in fact, I think it presents an alternate meeting between some of the characters, which was kind of confusing to me because I kept thinking, wait, you didn't meet this person the first time here. You met them in the next book. What's going on here? I actually think that people who aren't huge fans of the series might enjoy this more because you're not as invested in like the, the chronology being correct and everything. Diehard fans might be kind of irritated at how this doesn't fit in with the other things or that it repeats some of the same material. I'm not really sure where I fall into in the, those two categories I've just presented uh, because the books aren't really fresh in my memory. I think really I just thought it was okay and I enjoy having this really pretty copy of it but it's not it's not essential Madeline Lingle reading I guess is what I'm saying. Then I finally got around to reading Acadie or Acadie or however you want to pronounce that by Dave Hutchinson. This is a short space opera novella. It's about a colony that's been on the run from Earth. Um, it was founded by a scientist and other political dissidents who fled the Earth, stole a colonist ship with tens of thousands of colonists on it, and then set up their own little utopia-like colony. And 500 years later, the Earth is still looking for them to make them pay for their crimes, basically. And the colony um, learns that an Earth probe may have discovered them. They need to pack up and get out of town before they are apprehended, basically. There's a lot more to the setup than that, actually, including the fact that it's narrated by like this mayor guy who was invited into the colony long after it was established and was also kind of a dissident himself. And he doesn't really know what's going on either, but he's uh, following the procedures to evacuate the colony, basically. 
And I really loved the whole idea of this and the way it was written and the character's voice right up until the last couple of paragraphs because the ending of this, pun intended, threw me for a loop. It wasn't quite the horrible, it was all a dream ending, but it also wasn't quite a perfect recursive ending, something like Samuel R. Delaney would do. Delaney wrote a lot of science fiction stories that could be read just in an endless loop, things like Dahlgren and Empire Star, and I've always really admired how Delaney wrote those stories. It just, it works so well. And I think that Akity was almost doing that, but didn't quite pull it off. It felt, like I said, it felt like it was a little bit too close to the it was all a dream type of ending. And because it doesn't doesn't quite seem one or the other, I don't really know how to judge it. It was just going really, really well until this rather abrupt ending, which threw everything else into question. If there's ever a follow-up novella, I would totally read that. I want to know more about what happens after this, what the reality really is, but I'm not quite sure if there is a story beyond this. So maybe this really is a novella that should have been novel length. There's definitely enough substance there, there's enough story, there's enough world building, enough explanations that this could have been a novel. Instead, it's a slightly weirdly truncated novella. Next up is Marezi by Maria Tertshadanoff. This is translated, though it's one of those books that really doesn't want you to know who the translator is, so I'll have to Google search that and put it down below. So this is basically a young adult fantasy coming of age story, and I really liked it. It's a chronicle written by a teenage girl named Marezi. She lives at the Red Abbey on an isolated island. And the Red Abbey is essentially a haven and a refuge for women. Only women are allowed to set foot on the island, and they take in girls who just can't be cared for by their own families, who need to be fed and clothed and educated, but they also take in women who are fleeing abuses and such. When Marezi came to the island a few years ago, um, she did so out of necessity. Her family had uh, survived a hunger winter, but her younger sister had starved to death. And so she's there to kind of reduce the burden on her family who want the best for her. So Marezi has been there for a few years. She settled in, but she hasn't really chosen a specialty. She really doesn't know what she's going to do with her life and what her, her talents and her abilities are. And the story is about one year when another girl arrives at the island named Jai, and she brings great danger with her because she is pursued by men who want revenge. And the women are going to fight back against this. And Marezi has to come into her own. She has to accept her own abilities and her own calling in order to defend herself, her friend, and the Abbey and, and all the women in it. There's one thing about this that I want to say, which might be kind of spoilery, but it's something that I w wish I had known going into it because I was getting a bit nervous about it. This story doesn't shy away from the bad things that happen to the women. This is a world where women are abused and raped and treated horribly and they have to seek refuge at this place. So many of the characters there have abuse in their past. And it's mentioned, you know, Jai describes what happened to her and her sister and her mother, and I found that a little bit difficult to read about. And what I really wanted to know, and what happens, is the women persevere. At the end of the day, this is not a horrible grim story about how women are continually oppressed. It's about how they fight back and they succeed at creating this place where they are safe and can be happy and can live well. And that that was what I wanted. <laughs> That's probably why I enjoyed this so much, because it was in some ways um, gratifying. It was pleasant to read and get to the, the end and feel the things that I wanted to feel, if that makes any sense. So I quite enjoyed it. It didn't really feel like young adult to me, to be honest. I feel like this is a story that adults would also really like. There is another story in this world out, um, Naundel, which I believe is a prequel, not a sequel to this, but a prequel, which describes um, the original group of women who set up the Red Abbey, and I really want to read that now because it's out in English. 
Continuing on with more short things that I read, the next one is a novella by Connie Willis called I Met a Traveler in an Antique Land. This is newish, I think it came out in 2017 in Asimov's, and this is the hardcover edition that's just out now from Subterranean Press. I snatched it up, of course, because it's a Connie Willis novella, and it's about books. It's about a very strange little bookstore. That's all I needed to know because it's, it's a story for book lovers, for people who care very much about what happens to the last existing copies of books. Like, can they be saved before they're destroyed? It'd be really nice to know that they actually were or not. So this follows a man who is trying to escape the rain in New York City. He walks into this little bookstore and it turns out to be an entryway into a book saving operation which saves books right before they can be destroyed. And he's very curious. He wants to know what's going on. It doesn't make any sense. He keeps going further and further into this, the back of this bookstore, which goes into this very huge, mysterious warehouse, packed full of books that are organized in very odd ways by the manner of their destruction. And he's getting this tour of the warehouse and he's so confused because he's like, I know these books were destroyed and I know that you can't repair them and save them after what supposedly happened to them. Like you can't restore a book after it's been burned. But that seems to be what's happened. And that's pretty much the story. This man stumbles into a book saving operation and he doesn't really get any answers. What I particularly liked about it is that the explanation is never actually said, but if you've read enough of Connie Willis's books, you will know what the book saving device is. It's so obvious, but the words are never actually said. That just really tickled me. I don't, I don't know why. Um, I won't even say it here. You could probably tell what it is now, but I, I liked it. And like I said, this is a story for book lovers written by a book lover and a book champion. And it was really sweet because of that. Lud in the Mist by Hope Mirrlees. This is a fantasy novel from 1926 that I meant to get around to for a long time because I'm always hearing about it. It's apparently been a big influence on writers like Neil Gaiman and Michael Swanwick. In fact, I think Michael Swanwick wrote an entire book about Hope Mirrlees. So I really didn't know what I was going to get from this book. It turned out to be not at all what I really expected, but I really enjoyed it. It's basically about this town called Lud in the Mist set in a secondary world. They've previously had relations with Fairyland because they're very near to Fairyland, but they've cut themselves off. They've divorced themselves entirely from fairies and magic and any of those influences. And even to talk about those things is completely taboo. It's very vulgar. You just don't do that. But then the city is practically under attack from an influx of fairy fruit. There is a smuggling operation bringing fairy fruit into town and people are eating it, not knowing what it is. It's like a terrible influence on the younger people and everything. So the city, pe people in the city are investigating um, where the fairy fruit is coming from and how to stop it. And actually, I feel like the whole story is really about people who discover that they cannot cut themselves off from fairyland. They can't cut themselves off from what is essentially fun and creativity and the wild side of life. I feel like that's what the book is actually about, that you, you have to have the traditional and the staid and the normal, as well as the abnormal and the creative and dangerous and crazy things as well. One of the things that I like the most about this book is the writing and the language used. It's very dense and archaic. I really had to take my time in parsing parts of it and I really liked that. Because on the one hand, it is actually an old fantasy novel. It's like 90 years old. But also I think it was attempting to sound even older than that to sound kind of like an old fairy tale in some ways. And so there was just this pattern of age on the whole story that really enriched it and made it even more wonderful for some reason. Like I enjoyed 
the language and how old it felt. It really suited the story. On the whole, I just thought it was a delightful story. I really liked what it had to say about this relationship between the normal world and the fairy world. That was very interesting. And I would really highly recommend it, especially if you enjoy stories like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which are about fairies in many ways and, and fairy magic invading normal people's lives. These last three books are rather atypical for my channel, so I don't blame you at all if you want to skip this section, but I read them, so I'm going to talk about them. And they are three books from A Book Apart, which is a small publisher. Their tagline is Brief Books for People Who Make Websites. I'm no longer in web development or web design, but it's still kind of a side interest of mine. And I have really loved a bunch of the books that A Book Apart has done. And I find that even today, a lot of their topics overlap with what I do professionally still. So I occasionally go to their catalog and order a couple of them. I got these last year and I'm finally reading them now. And as you'll tell, I've forgotten why I ordered at least one of them. The first one is Demystifying Public Speaking by Laura Hogan. This is the one I don't know why I bought it. I did not need this book at all. I think I expected it to drop some gems about overcoming the fear of public speaking, but that's not what it's about. This is geared towards people who want to give um, speeches or presentations or public talks like up on a stage at conferences. And that is not the type of public speaking that I aspire to do. I'd be happy if I went my entire life without ever having to do that. So what it really does is break down the major stages of developing a public presentation picking your topic, writing it out, practicing it, getting feedback from other people, and then actually giving the presentation. I think it achieves what it sets out to do, but there's one glaring omission from this book that would have elevated this to the next level, and that is examples. This book would have been a great teaching tool if it had examples of real successful talks that were dissected and analyzed and broken down, or maybe even if Hogan had interviewed more people who were successful speakers and had them talk about the process somewhat. Instead, it's really just kind of like a reference guide, and I feel like the content here, the advice and instructions could have been boiled down into a checklist, practically, or a relatively short article rather than an entire book. The next one is JavaScript for Web Designers by Matt Marquis, which is an excellent introduction to the basics of JavaScript aimed at people who probably don't know anything like a programming language or anything similar to JavaScript. This was very well written, very well explained. It was easy to follow, and I really liked that it was all organized around a project. So you follow along with the steps in every chapter and you can create this very useful tool that any web designer would need in a website project probably. So the whole thing was really great and very good at teaching the reader. The only drawback for me is that I really don't want to learn JavaScript anymore. I didn't really have a need for the knowledge in this book, so it, it was a little bit flat to me. I wasn't really invested in, in learning the material while I was reading it. So this one is going to sit on my reference shelf, and I know that someday I will need it and it will be very helpful. Lastly is Design for Real Life by Eric Meyer and Sarah Vachter Bocher. I've been sitting here trying to talk about this book for a very long time, and I'm getting a bit frustrated that the words are just not coming. I feel very odd saying that I felt so strongly and emotionally about this book when it's about web design, but it's actually a very emotionally charged topic because I think that this book is really an argument for compassion and kindness in web design. It's about creating online projects that truly help people even when they are at their most vulnerable and most stressed. It's about designing for edge cases and stress cases first rather than taking the easy route and only building for an audience that you've made a lot of assumptions about, designing for the common denominator basically. And it's a lot harder to, to do this. It, it requires you to do a lot of research and to really think through all of the decisions that you've made and the 
consequences of them, not just what you intend, but also the unintended consequences. The reason I think this is so emotionally charged is because of the examples. There are a lot of case studies and scenarios that the authors break down. They show you how something went wrong, why it went wrong, and then how it was fixed. So it's a lot of before and afters, but it dives into some subjects like um, sexual abuse victims using websites to try to determine if they've actually been raped or not. It's about things like hospital websites that are completely unusable, even on a good day, but especially awful when you're trying to use them on the worst day of your life when you're in an ambulance rushing your dying child to the hospital. Like, these are the instances when your tool, your, your website should be the most helpful and the easiest to use and the most compassionate, but frequently those are the exact times when they stop working well. And yeah, it, I, was, I was of course very convinced by the argument here. I think this is a wonderful idea. I've never personally had an experience with a website quite like the authors have, but I think there are a lot of people out there who have stories like this where, you know, it sounds silly to say a website hurt me, but it actually does happen quite a bit. It was a great book, it was excellently written, and I feel like the authors were very good at incorporating their own experiences and the experiences of other people to make their argument perfectly, as well as providing very helpful information for fixing your own process if you develop websites. It was great. I should stop talking now. <laughs> Those are all the things that I read in April. I really do need to stop talking now because I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. <laughs> Let me know if you've read any of these, what your thoughts are on them, and I'll be back very soon to talk to you about what I read in May. And until then, bye.